I'd like to call Monday, May 9th, meeting to order. <coughs> stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and the invocation by Vice Mayor Pazillo. And please stay standing for the grace. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Almighty Father, I ask that you look over the city council as we go about doing the business of the citizens of Goodyear. I ask that you provide the wisdom and clarity for us to make good decisions, and I ask that you protect our men and women in uniform as they go about serving our city, state, and nation. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All are present. If this, I'm not sure what microphone is on. There we go. Uh, there are no uh, expenditures to ratify, and uh, we're going to start out with communications, and we'll start out first with proclamation to recognize May 15th to the 21st, 2011, National Emergency Medical Service Week. coming up to me. Thank you. <laughs> I just love my man in blue. Proclamation. Whereas emergency medical services is a vital public service, and whereas the members of the Goodyear Fire Department are ready to provide life-saving care to those in need 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and whereas access to quality emergency care dramatically improves the survival and the recovery rate of those who experience sudden illnesses and injury. Whereas the emergency medical service system consists of emergency physicians, emergency nurses, emergency medical technicians, paramedics, firefighters, educators, and administrators and others. And whereas the member of the emergency medical service teams of the Central Arizona Life Safety System Council. It engages in thousands of hours specializing training and continuing education to enhance their life-saving skills. And whereas it is appropriate, appropriate to recognize the value and the accomplishments of the members of the Goodyear Fire Department by designating Emergency Medical Services Week. Therefore, I feel very privileged as Georgia Lord the Mayor of Goodyear, in recognition of this event, to, to hereby proclaim this week, May 15th to the 21st, 2011, as the Emergency Medical Service Week. Given under the hand and the seal of the City of, of Goodyear, Arizona, on the ninth day of May, 2011. And thank you, and thank you for the entire team for all that you do for us. All right, the next one is a proclamation to recognize, so apropos for what we've been discussing, May 16th, the 20th, 2011, as the National Small Business Week. And uh, Harry Paxton has a presentation to highlight the local small businesses. Harry? Thank you, Mayor. Madam Mayor and members of the council, as you are aware, are, as you are aware the city pro provides prides itself on fostering relationships, positive relationships with our businesses. We offer several services to assist our business community. For example, each business that registers with Goodyear can elect to have a presence on the City of Goodyear website. Goodyear's Shop Goodyear program on the city's website provides visitors a one-stop shop to find all registered businesses located in Goodyear with a map location, company logo, job openings, specials and coupons, and even a link to the business's website. The police department provides Protect Your Business program that helps businesses receive crime prevention tips and also up-to-date information on crime trends. Small business breakfasts, which we've offered, have helped our businesses learn business topics such as social media marketing, credit management, leasing options, and other topics critical to business today. 
Through the city's business retention and expansion program, this last year we've assisted 30 businesses, existing businesses here in Goodyear. That assistance has included access to incentive programs that help them to expand, assistance with navigating through permit, the permit process, finding a new location within Goodyear, and assisting with many other needs requested by our existing businesses. To further extend the city's connection to businesses, invitational breakfasts are being planned for the mayor, one or more council members, the city manager, and also city staff to meet with good, the Goodyear business community to continue to build an effective working relationships with our businesses. The goal is to provide another avenue for local businesses to interact with their elected officials and with city staff. The city of Goodyear launches this initiative by recognizing Small Business Week later this month, May 16th through the 20th, and by the Small Business Week proclamation that the mayor will read shortly after we have two guests speak to us. In the past, we've presented before you several businesses, some businesses creating hundreds of jobs in the city of Goodyear. <coughs> but tonight, what we want to do in honor of Small Business Week is to present to you and highlight a couple of businesses that are here in our community that are small businesses but prominent businesses that are growing and expanding. First, we'll hear from Paul Smiley, president of Sonoran Technologies. Paul has been in business for four years here in Goodyear and currently has 38 employees. His area of business is federal and defense services, including support of operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. After Paul, we'll hear from Scott Chestnut, program director with Prime Solutions Group. Scott's also accompanied by Paige Angleson, who is here tonight as well with Prime Solutions Group. Prime Solutions Group is a full-service aerospace consulting company. And what was very interesting after we put this together, we realized that Paul Smiley and also Scott Chestnut are both retired from the Air Force and with distinguished careers. <laughs> so with that, we'll first have Paul come up and then, and then Scott. Mayor, members of the council, thank you so much for honoring small business. I really thank you for walking the walk. Uh, there's a lot that people don't know about small businesses. First of all, they're coming in a lot of different flavors. And in 2007, during the worst recession since 1932, my business partner, Peter Aaronfield, Peter, stand up. We launched Sonoran Technology. Um, and long story short, in four years, we have about 30 employees. I just got the airplane about a couple hours ago delivering a multi-million dollar proposal to the Air Force, the Scott Air Force Base. So hopefully we have about 40 more employees real soon. I'm heading back to El Paso tonight with the, with, with the VA. And uh, I would tell you when it comes to small businesses, whether it's home-based or in a large building or you're doing service or sell, selling things, two things stand out for small businesses. That is leadership, commitment, and talent. And I would tell you when it comes to talent, that's what separates most small businesses from those who aren't doing very well. I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, last October, we had to hire a new accounting and finance manager. And we had a young lady here in the West Valley who was driving an hour and a half to Scottsdale every day, each way. And uh, she was just a brilliant find for us. My point is this. When it comes to small businesses, not only talent, we need to pay people a good salary, but also create a quality of life that they like to stay here in Goodyear. I've been here for 10 years since I got here from the Pentagon and retired in 2002. But I would tell you, when it comes to small business, there's not a better thing to be in to say, hey, I have control. And the most important thing and the most gratitude I get is putting people back to work. When you put people back to work, they spend dollars on services and goods. And hopefully those services and goods and products will be bought here in the city of Goodyear. Now, during the last election, I know there was a lot of talk about who supports small business and who doesn't. <laughs> I'm not a politician. I hope I never will be. But I will, <laughs> but I will tell you this. In 2010, uh, then Vice Mayor Lowe and I had a chance to accompany the Greater Phoenix Economic Council back to Washington, D.C., a group of 60 people, the governor, uh, uh, lots of bankers, lots of mayors and vice mayors, Candace Weiss from West Valley National Bank. And we went back for one reason, not to be Republicans or Democrats or Tea Party independent folks. We went back to put a new face on the state of Arizona and in Goodyear, Arizona. And I tell you, we, we met with congressmen, senators, uh, four-star generals. We talked about everything from the F-35 to getting loans to the Treasury Department uh, to nuclear uh, plants and, and renewable energy. And we had to do that for a reason, because outside this, this state, people have a different view of Arizona. 
and we had to go back there and put a good face on our state. You know, we have some tough time with the housing market, but we will rebound. So I'm, I'm so proud of the council that you have raised above the fray to make sure that Goodyear is a place where people love to work and love to play, and I'm just ha happy to be here. Our small business, we do a lot of great things, and I'm so happy that we support rural world operations uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq. I can't tell you all the good stuff like that. But also, we support 70 VA hospitals in Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, 41 clinics who serve 225,000 veterans. So when I go to El Paso tonight and work with the VA in El Paso tomorrow, it's fun for me. It's actually giving back, and I think every small business owner loves to give back to the community. So thank you, Mayor Lowe and the council for recognizing small businesses, for walking the walk, and we look forward to a great, prosperous uh, future for our city. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd like to have your business partner come up, too. Oh, go Air Force. I love it. And I have to thank you for your uh, speech tonight, or I can't say it's a speech, for your genuine words that you gave to our council and to our citizens. We really need that. Um, and it's, we're just so glad that you're in our city and that, that you decided to have your business here in Goodyear. So with that, I will stop talking and oh, read. Okay. Whereas the President of the United States has proclaimed May 16th to the 20th, 2011, as National Small Business Week, the city of Goodyear recognized the significance of our local small business owners and the entrepreneurs. And whereas the city of Goodyear values, oh, we value your spirit of entrepreneurship with our, within our community. And whereas small business plays a vital role in our city's economy, economic vitality, and contributes to our community's prosperity. And whereas the city is committed to strengthening small business relationships and enabling their success and pursuit of the American dream. Whereas small businesses drive economic growth, innovation, and create new opportunities for jobs. Whereas we celebrate the role of small business owners and entrepreneurs in our community, who are the engine, let's repeat that, who are the engine of our city's progress and the proud reflection of our character. Now, therefore, I, Georgia Lord, Mayor of the City of Goodyear, in recognition of this, do hereby proclaim the week May 15th to the 21st, 2011, as Small Business Week in Goodyear, given under my hand and the seal of the City of Goodyear, Arizona, this ninth day of May 2011. And once more, thank you, gentlemen, so much. I have two just a moment. Scott, you're going to say a few words? I would like to. Thank you. Please. Well, good evening, Mayor Lord and uh, members of the council. Thank you so much, uh, not only for having Small Business Week and recognizing that, but also inviting our two companies in. Uh, I'll provide a transition here. I retired across the Potomac from, from Paul uh, over at Bowling Air Force Base, and we both made the right decision and came right back to Arizona. Okay. <laughs> and we're both very happy with it. Uh, but I'll, I'll take just a few minutes tonight uh, telling you, I do have some slides uh, to get me through it, and, and as the mayor knows, uh, an Air Force member can't do anything without PowerPoint, so I will make it quick. The next slide, please. Prime Solutions Group is a systems engineering and technical assistance company. Uh, we also specialize in program management. We're almost all retired military of some sort uh, and from the local area. We're growing into a couple of areas. One is a relationship with the Avnet company as an IBM reseller. And another area that's very exciting is partnering with the academic community at Arizona State University to work on SBIR and STTR grant projects in high technology. So we enjoy that as well. Next slide. But I'm here tonight to tell you why we love being in Goodyear. Uh, probably the first element of, of a great environment for small business in Goodyear is the people. Not only the great people on the council and in the city, uh, but also the highly talented engineers that have been associated with Lockheed Martin and other high-tech companies in the area. 
And by the way, you mentioned the personal touch. I do want to thank a few people. We've already had Paul Yardo, Paul Zampini, and Harry Paxton in our offices. And that was a great personal touch early uh, in our growth. Next slide. Of course, in this austere environment for small businesses, any break that a small business can get is significant. And we are certainly enjoying being in a military reuse zone. Uh, the tax benefits are just wonderful. Uh, it's adjacent to some of the companies that we have contracts with. And there's many other advantages of the size of the facility and that type of thing. And uh, th that campus has worked with us very well on making sure that we're well taken care of along with the city. Next slide. Can't get away from location, location, location. And in addition to Goodyear being center state and also center region, uh, the fact that we are near a freeway has been great. And even the fact that we're on an airport with a couple of us as private pilots who've been able to use that as a commuter uh, hub uh, to go off on business trips. That's also been uh, a great advantage. Next slide. You can't be a small business in today's environment without <coughs> partnering up with a lot of other small businesses. And we have partnered up, for instance, with Sonoran Technologies already to discuss contracting. But in addition to that, we're part of the Air Force Association. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, the Army Association, Chambers of Commerce, Small Business Associations, the Arizona Tech Council, uh, and as I mentioned, ASU in several of their um, areas. And even at the state level, Joe Marvin, uh, the president of PSG, sits on the uh, Arizona Aerospace and Defense Commission. We also encourage and mentor several industry groups like INCOSI, which is a group of systems engineers. Next slide. And I mentioned the Air Force Association, and I'm going to make a plug here for a great community event that we are working with the Wigwam Resort on right now and several other vendors. And uh, all the committee mem or, or council members, you do have a brochure on that in front of you. This is coming up on June 24th. It's uh, Really, the major event is on, on the 25th, which is Saturday, one-day event. You are all very welcome to be there, and I think you would get a lot out of it. Because beyond just discussing the future of the Air Force, we'll also be talking about the future of aerospace and defense, particularly in the West Valley. So if you have any questions on that, please do contact us. Next slide. Okay, my last slide <laughs> was basically the the bottom line that we are a rapidly growing company and, and I appreciate the fact that that was highlighted this time. There are some unique challenges that early stage companies have and I've mentioned some of the things that really helped us to, to get along in that regard. Um, our bottom line is to try to bring new jobs to Arizona, more aerospace revenue to Arizona and to continue to innovate which is what small businesses do best. Thank you all very much for your support and thank you for having us tonight. taken with yeah. me and so <laughs> and I am joined I'm sorry I'm joined by Paige Engelson from our company as well So can I see you on the other side of that? The next is a proclamation to recognize May 15th to the 21st, 2011 as Public Works Week. The public works services provide in our community an integral part of the citizens' lives. And whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public works system and programs, such as water, sewer, streets, highways, public buildings, fleet operations, and solid waste collection, as whereas the health, safety, and comfort of this community greatly depends on these facilities and services, whereas the quality and effectiveness of these 
having a little trouble this <laughs> evening, facilities, as well as their planning, design, and construction is vital to dependent upon the efforts and skill of public work officials, and whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff public works departments is materially <coughs> influenced by people's attitudes, good attitudes, and understanding of the importance of the work they perform. Now, therefore, I, Georgia Lord, Mayor of the City of Goodyear, do hereby proclaim this week, May 15th to the 21st, 2011, National Public Works Weeks, <coughs> given under my hand and the seal of the City of Goodyear of Arizona, the ninth day of May, 2011. Thank you so much for your department and all the work they do. <coughs> Now is the time for any citizens' uh, comments or appearances from the floor. Do we have someone? I do have one speaker card. All right. Jose Cusne. Madam Mayor, members, distinguished members of the City Council, distinguished audience. Uh, first, thank you for the opportunity for this public <coughs> forum and an average citizen like myself to come and is and try to advocate for something that I consider important. But first, I, I'm a retired engineer officer of the Public Health Service. I chose the city of good year as to have my retirement years and uh, now we live in Cantamia as uh, enjoying the, the services that you provide and this wonderful city provides. And I'm very proud to be a citizen of good year. Uh, the reason I'm taking this stand is to advocate and encourage the use, and by the way, it's making a picture of what you mentioned, the public works department for the services that the engineering department provides. But I want to advocate as a standard measure to sustain quality and effectiveness of uh, the infrastructure because I consider the infrastructure as the economic engine for progress in business and, and innovation uh, of the citizens. The facilities condition index measures, as, uh, like the pavement condition index, measures excellence of failure of the, of, as the conditions of the infrastructures are aging. You know what, so we don't want to see facilities that are 10 years old or five years old looking like 100 years old. So I'm suggesting to use the facility conditions index uh, th through a policy as a standard measure to track the excellence or failure of the facilities in the decision-making process to do investments. This in order to have an operation and maintenance sustainable program like it is currently being maintained uh, as, uh, as it was mentioned by the small businesses and by your award to the Public Works Department. If we use the facility condition index, that is translated to the citizen terminology of excellence or poor or failure, but I hope that this tangible and objective measure is used for the water and sewer, solid waste, and the buildings that the city of Goodyear uh, owns. That, that is my pitch. Thank <laughs> you very much, and I Thank appreciate you. I didn't give you any guidelines in telling you how you had the three minutes, and you did just beautifully and caught it within the time. The beeping over there. So yes. <laughs> I, 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 
I have to congratulate you because many times we do tell them and they have the three minutes and they go way over it and you were very sensitive to that and good ears, heard the little signal. I thank you so much. I hope to enjoy and join many uh, committees that the city council may have for engineers like me. I'm an environmental civil engineer. Well, I'm going to tell you what we'd like you to do then. Enter the city hall, and there's an application there that you can put your name and address and telephone number, and we will call you when that, uh, we find, we've, you know, we have the need. I look we, forward to we it. We appreciate that. <laughs> and did the city uh, manager get the information, enough information collected mm. to uh, know the direction we're taking? It was a facility policy. Yeah, uh, Mayor and members of the council, it, essentially it is what standards that we have in place for looking at facilities, looking for water, wastewater, uh, pavement management index, which we do now. So there are several of those we have in place. If it's something that the council would like to see what those standards are, we can certainly bring that back. Would it? Would you appreciate a letter on this telling you I this thing? Because I'm interested in an, an ongoing flow of information, an annual yearly report, so we know if the facilities are deteriorating or are being sustainable. Sure. Well, then why don't we first of all give him some type of uh, a letter or report, and then we could <coughs> work from there. Uh, we would be happy also to meet with him, uh, to talk with him to, to find okay. out exactly what is of interest. So I would suggest that first. If the council wants something back, we can get that to you as well. Sure. Either one, but there are the standards are at the National Academy of Science, and they were developed in 2005. Great. Thank you. Well, I believe the city clerk has the name and telephone number. All right, fine. Thank you. And now we're ready to go to the consent agenda, and we only have one on the uh, agenda tonight, and that's the approval of the minutes. Um, and would the city clerk, I don't think you really have anything to read tonight. I'll read the first one. That's fine. Approved draft minutes of work session, a regular meeting, and a special meeting held on April 11, 2011, and a special meeting held on April 18, 2011. Thank you. And of course, I'll ask if anyone on the public wish wishes to remove an item, and the item would be this. I see none. I'll ask the council if you wish to remove this item for any reason. I see none. Then I'll ask for a motion and a second. Approve the acceptance of the consent agenda as read by the uh, city Se clerk. Second. Second. I hear a motion by uh, Councilman uh, Sousa and a second by Councilman Pozzillo. Roll call, please. Councilmember Sousa. Aye. Councilmember Osborne. Aye. Vice Mayor Pozzillo. Aye. Aye. Councilmember Campbell? Aye. Councilmember Gelzer? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. Yes, it's 7 0. Thank you. Now, on to the business. And the first uh, item is A assessment of fees in addition to all monies owed due to the city after debt remains unpaid for 30 days after the due date. Uh, we're going to conduct a, a public um, hearing to assess fees in addition to all monies owed or due to the city after debt remains unpaid for 30 days and after the due date. This is open public hearing. Staff presentation, Larry Lang. Thank you, Mayor Lord. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, over the past few years, the city has increased its use of collection agencies to collect past due amounts. Uh, this is after letters from our attorney, uh, from the city attorney, uh, and that we have done all internal methods to uh, try to collect on those accounts. What Ordinance 11-1237 is, is designed and intended to do primarily is to allow the city to uh, pass through the costs of the collection agency and other direct costs to the, the, um, uh, to the person who, uh, who owes that money. Um, this fee in the past has been paid by the city. In fiscal year 9-10, the city paid approximately $5,400 in these types of charges. Um, and the primary area historically has been an outstanding utility bills, uh, but we'll be expanding it to other billing areas to try to have a consistent process as we uh, go through. 
The other area that is a change in this is um, uh, the current code states that a delinquent fee of 1.5% will be charged on those accounts and this will allow it to be charged on a monthly basis. With that, I'll take any questions or uh, if you'd rather wait until after you receive public comment uh, for you. those questions. Do we have any public comment on this item? All right then. Um, do you want to do uh, the council? Do you have any comments or questions? Close the whole hearing. Uh, do I have to close the hearing first? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's close the hearing so you can get your comments in. Hearing closed, thank you. And now I'll ask to uh, have the clerk read the ordinance, please. of the Goodyear City Code by adding section 1-8-2 collections providing for severability and an effective date. Could I have a motion and a second please? Move the adoption of the ordinance. Second. I hear a motion by Councilman Souza and a second by Councilwoman Osborne. Uh, it's open for discussion. Councilwoman Lovartano. Uh, I just have a question. When we send it out to a collection agency or if we it, it seems like we have the right also to to sue them as well right that's correct we have a number of options available and collection agency is just one of those options when we do that how do we ever go after if we get a judgment do we collect or garnish or what do we do to get the money that's owed um, Obviously, it's a number of things. The collection agency is one means be that really works when we haven't been able to locate the people. Um, uh, if we get a judgment, we also can file a lien under our ordinances, at least for a utility bill. Um, I'll, the city attorney can answer this if I mess it up, but basically uh, the problems with that is that you have to update it periodically. I believe it's annually for that lien to remain in effect. Do you want to take that? Uh, uh, you're accurate. I think we've primarily been using the collections agency. I don't believe we've actually filed any lawsuits on the collections, but we have utilized the lien process. I, I was just curious because I saw there were other remedies, so thank you. Okay. Um, just real quick. Councilman Pazilla. What's the current uh, billing fee, uh, Larry? You have one point, it's going to 1.5? Per month, uh, after the 30 current days. rate is a one-time fee of 1.5 percent. Okay, so this allows it to be monthly. Okay. Is that is that your question? Yeah, that's my question. Councilwoman Campo, I wanted to know: are we are we successful in collecting when we go to collection agencies? Somewhat. Uh, a little bit. We're more successful than we were in those accounts beforehand. Okay. Um, we're we're working on improving it. Thanks. Any other questions? And I'll ask for a roll call, please. Thank you, Larry. Councilmember Osborne? Aye. Vice Mayor Pizzillo? Aye. Councilmember Loritano? Aye. Councilmember Campbell? Aye. Councilmember Gilzer? Aye. Councilmember Sousa? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. Passes 7 0. Thank you. So you're staying right up there, Larry. Um, Amanda Goodyear City Council to comply with the changes made by the Arizona State Legislature regarding collections of unpaid water and wastewater charge. Larry Lang to present. Okay, thank you. If I could get the presentation there, thank you. Um, tonight we're going to talk first about, or this item is to talk about ordinance changes, changes needed to the city code to make them consistent with state law that was adopted both in the 2010 session and a subsequent law in 2011. Uh, House Bill 2450 that was adopted in May of 2010 prohibited municipalities from holding property owners responsible for renters' uh, delinquent utility bills further pro prohibited municipalities from denying utility service to a new tenant of a property if there was an outstanding bill still on that property. Uh, then in the most recently complete, completed legislative session adopted in April of 2011, House Bill 2193, 
expanded on 2450, uh, adding that only a person who physically resided at the property and received the surface may be held responsible for the water and wastewater they use. The Goodyear City Code, as it is written today, uh, actually uh, allows the charge of the utility bill for renters to the property owner's um, account and requires them to be <coughs> responsible for it. We have not been enforcing that since House Bill 2450 took effect over a year ago, but this ordinance change is to uh, make it consistent with, uh, with the state law. As a little background, and this is just a very brief background, the next item we can talk about this in a little more depth. Um, as you see from the chart on the left that gives you a breakdown of the, our uh, residential utility customers by type of account, 85% of our accounts are held by the, the property owners. 14% are held by renters and 1% um, are held in the name of property managers. If you look at our delinquent accounts, on the other hand, 55% of our delinquent accounts are held by property owners, 43% are held by renters, and the property managers are held at 2%, very consistent with their ownership. <coughs> So 14% for, of our customers account for 43% of our delinquencies, and that 14% is a little bit more difficult uh, to find after they've left um, the residence. A little history on our um, collection rates since 2006-2007. Uh, You'll notice in 2000. Six, seven, that fiscal year, we had uh, unpaid accounts um, that are still outstanding today, 201 accounts, totaling about $75,000. Uh, that represents 0.42% of the billings for that particular year. Fiscal year 07 08, that increased to 509 accounts and 198,000 as the economy tightened. Fiscal year 0809 increased to 700 accounts and 207,000. Fiscal year 910 increased to 560 accounts or decreased to 560 accounts and represented about $119,000. And so far in fiscal year 1011 through 10 months, we've actually increased from last year to 654 accounts for a total outstanding of $129,000. That still represents 0.68, that's less than 1% of our total billings, which all in all is, is pretty good. Um, we will discuss those a little bit more as we get to, um, to the, the next agenda item after this, but wanted to give you that as a brief breakdown. So what are the proposed changes to comply with the statutes? Uh, we're going to be making changes to both Chapter 12 and Chapter 14 relating to water and sewer. We're not changing the sanitation code as uh, that did not have that language in it and, and did not need to be changed. Um, the changes that are being made are um, intended to comply with the legislation as adopted um, and yet at the same <coughs> time protect the city from delinquent debtors. So we're altering the deposit refund terms in the proposed um, ordinance and those refund terms <coughs> would uh, uh, state that the deposit will be returned um, after service is completed shut off at the property and all bills have been paid. Uh, providing a little more flexibility for uh, customers <coughs> who pay the deposit fees. Currently the deposit fee is payable one time at $100. Um, the proposal would allow it to be paid in three increments, um, which if the council goes forward with the increased deposit on the next item would be three increments of $75, totaling $225. Uh, 
addresses some uh, privacy issues um, and creates consistency between uh, both chapters in there. So some of the changes that were made in there is that were applicable the term property owner or landlord were changed to customer. Uh, also clarifications made so that liens may be placed on a property only when the property owner is responsible for the outstanding debt. In other words, they cannot be made on, on um, if a renter uh, tenant is the one that is responsible for that debt. So we have a few um, items within the deposits that I would like to address in there. As far as the policy on waivers of the deposit, we're not recommending changes to that. Those deposits will be waived with written proof of payments made to a public utility or governmental entity for a period of one year within 18 months of, the ser uh, of service. Uh, the city does accept letters from other municipalities APS, even utility companies in other states and in Canada. Uh, refunds, this is changing. The current code uh, provides refunds after a year of prompt payments. The proposal would have refunds only after an account is closed and outstanding balances are paid in full. Uh, provision is added, as I indicated previously, to allow customers to pay in monthly installments. We've added a provision for an additional deposit if um, a customer is uh, delinquent and going through some type of a collection a action three times within a year. This isn't a mandatory deposit. This is something that we have the right to ask and require that deposit um, at that point in time. Uh, and then we uh, do retain an optional landlord contract that if the property owner wants to enter into a contract with <coughs> the city in order to waive the deposit on behalf of their rental, that if they accepted responsibility for the bill, we would allow that. We don't expect that to be a frequent uh, case, but if that's what a property owner desires to do, uh, this would allow it. Um, as far as payments and collections, sec, um, sections are added outlining the restoration of service that says that the service will not be restored to a customer until utility bills, activation fees, and additional amounts have been paid in full. But it does, uh, does allow us to, um, as, as in the past, to, to uh, allow um, payment arrangements when, um, when they are available. Um, so we can continue to work with people and as long as they honor their payment arrangements, we'll be able to go forward. Um, with that, I'll take any questions on the ordinance that you may have and on, on um, this particular agenda item. Is there, a, shall we start first with public, any public comments? I do not have any. Thank uh, you. I do have one card here from Amanda Wright who said that she only needs to speak if necessary. I would expect that those comments would be on this part of the presentation um, because of the consistency in the bill. If, that's so. <coughs> if, you, if you wanted to make that a comment. I didn't hear. So they, uh, just in support? Yes, okay. uh, she is in. Uh, she represents Weimar, the West, um, All right. and Maricopa Association of Realtors. Okay, well then I'm going to ask the uh, clerk to read the ordinance by title only, please. Adopt Ordinance 11-1238, amending Chapter 12, Sewers, and Chapter 14, Water, of the Goodyear City Code by amending Section 12-2-3, Guarantee Deposit, Section 12-2-4, Monthly Charges and Rates, Section 12-8-1, Sewer Liens of Chapter 12, Sewer, and amending Section 14-2-4, Grounds for Rejection of Application, Section 14-2-5, Violation of Application Provisions, Section 14-3-1, 
Water Deposit Required, Section 14-5-4, Water Consumer Service Fees and Payment, Section 14-7-1, Water Consumer Facilities, Section 14-12-1, Water Imposition of Liens of Chapter 14, Water, Providing for Severability and an Effective Date. Thank you. Could I hear a motion and a second, please? So moved. Uh, second? Second. Uh, I hear a motion by uh, Councilman Loretano and a second by Councilman Joanne Osborne. Is that who? No. I'm sorry. Campbell. Campbell, thank you. Roll call, please. Oh, discussion. Sorry. Sorry. Discussion. I've got. Councilman <coughs> Gelzer. Larry, could you go back to your um, chart on the unpaid accounts and the outstanding balances? And yes. what, uh, what I noticed from this is as soon as the legislation got passed, all of a sudden we have a 20% increase in delinquent accounts. <coughs> um, is that a result of the fact that we're not going after um, property owners when they have deadbeat tenants? Um, that's a good question, and I'll be honest with you. We haven't analyzed the data that closely that I can give you a, a fair answer to that question. I, I think the economy is tight. We've seen it continuing tight. Um, and so I think that both of it comes into play. I think it's a good assumption. I uh, just haven't got the data analyzed to give you factually that statement. Um, follow on question. Of all these outstanding balances, can you give us a general idea of what we've recovered over the last several years uh, as a percentage? These are the balances that exist today. And we have not recovered any of this money. This money has not been recovered at this point. Um, this, uh, over this same time frame as a frame of reference, we've billed out a total of $100 million. And so we've collected, obviously, the vast majority of that in this time frame. Um, we didn't calculate by year what we had to go and do other measures for, and so I don't have a measure to give you 06, 07, was it, when it was a year old, was it 300 accounts? I can't answer do you that. Have, do you have a general idea of how many um, accounts? These are write-offs. You know, in, in other words, we're looking at 130,000 of write-offs this year, probably 150,000 when we finish up the fiscal year. Can you give me an estimate of how many slow payers and delays and, you know, that the finance department, I mean, this is accounts receivable that the city has to carry the money. Um, what percentage of what we bill, that hundred million that we bill out are, are we having as an issue? Uh, the hundred million, by the way, was a total for five years. Okay. Uh, just 20 million. Yeah, 20 per year is a good estimate. Um, our accounts, like most others, you always have the delinquent accounts that take a lot of your staff time. We have four customer service representatives that are dealing with customer issues on a daily basis, and they do tend to deal with, with those delinquent accounts. Um, this week is, is not our largest particular route, uh, so our billing cycle for this week, I would guess, has somewhere in the area of about um, 5,000 customers, and the turnoff letters are going to, I think it was 220 of them this week that they're trying to get collected that will shut, we will not turn off 220 accounts, but that's how many get down to the last week before their service is turned off out of about 5,000 customers. Let me see if my estimate's right. Is that pretty close? Yeah. Okay. How, um, how many days in arrears before we, in other words, the customer gets a <coughs> monthly bill, they don't pay it, are we talking to them within 15 days? Are we talking to them within 30 days so they have another monthly bill? You know, how, how far are we extending credit to these people? Yes. Um, the, from the time of the bill to the time of the shutoff, 
uh, under our, our normal system is 54 days. So that means that they are one full month past the due date on that bill at that time. If you go from the time of service, obviously the bill gets sent out a week after the meter read, which covers the previous month. So you add that 37 days to it, you're almost three months from the time you provided the service by the time the water is being shut off. Okay, thank you very much. And the time frame before it goes to the collection agency? From we that do point? Not, we do not prescribe that time frame because we try to go through other collection means prior to sending it to a collection agency. Uh, so we will, um, <coughs> it could be right at that point if we have worked every avenue at that point, but I think normally after that there is a letter that goes from the city attorney's office advising the customer that it will be sent over to the collection agency if they don't pay within, I believe it's 10 days. That letter is sent out after the shutoff notice and after we've done what we believe is what we can on that account. Uh, Councilwoman Laura Tano. Uh, I have a couple questions. Um, first of all, I like the waiver, um, the, the waiver, bleh, I, can't, I can't speak tonight either. See, I had the same uh, problem, don't the, worry about The it. waiver section you have, because I think that was one of our concerns was we didn't want to punish people with, with good credit or with a good pay and so it, it sounds like it's very broad what you will accept for that. Uh, my question is though, if someone had been paying on time an owner, paying on time for a year, then technically if they move someone el else, they could use us as a good pay. So I guess I still don't see why we don't give them any benefit as well. I'm, I, I, I'm not if, sure if I, I live in Goodyear and I pay my city of Goodyear bill every month, for say two years and then I go move to Phoenix, I can go show my letter that I paid good to um, Goodyear, show it to Phoenix and get my fee waived there. So it seems like we should have some sort of, if someone's paid for a significant period of time, uh, release of, of their um, fee as well. You're saying the release of the deposit? Yeah, that release paid. of the deposit. It just seems like if I could use Goodyear as a good payment, if I were to move somewhere else, it, I should be rewarded for paying. And I know that's not everybody. It might affect more of the first-time home buyers who maybe haven't set up a utility ac account ever before or anything. It just seems like I could use Goodyear as my reference somewhere else. The, the primary, um, and I, I think that's a very excellent question, and that's our existing policy today. And the ordinance would change that if, if passed as presented to you. The primary uh, motivator on that, first of all, I think that your typical property owner, even first time property owner, is going to have a utility history that they're going to be able to show. Uh, when we were charging property owners or property managers for the fees before we would let someone come look at the property or someone else move in, and we, told them that the renter had indeed paid a deposit but had been paid back after a year, that didn't sit real well with them. And we, so we did have some experience that indicated that people <coughs> had um, actually been refunded deposits and then moved on. That's why it was written that way. If the council, I mean, that obviously, if you have questions on or concerns on that, uh, that part can re be retained the way it is if that's your preference. And then I have one final question. Do we charge an interest on say the $207,000? I mean, do, do these balances accrue interest, these old balances at all, or is there any additional interest that we can accrue for that? Uh, the last item that we did will allow us to charge that interest moving <coughs> forward. But that's going forward, but these others, we don't have any interest on these others. We have late fees and other penalties in those, uh, but um, no, we don't. Like Gary said, those are pretty much, you're probably not going to get much from those at this point. The older ones. With the 08, 09, I wouldn't expect to see a whole lot. Okay. That's correct. But moving forward, this allows us to charge that interest so that we do right. kind of and we do have a monthly late charge, so I, I, you know, there is a charge that runs through, but this one I think is just a little cleaner. 
Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilman Souza? Yes, thank you. Do delinquencies have any effect on an individual credit rating? Uh, delinquencies can, if they're reported to uh, credit a uh, Report them. Uh, do we report? Yes, we do. Do we spell that out in our letters to uh, the delinquents? I think most of our procedures, including what we're talking about this evening, are intended to be communicated ahead of time to avoid delinquencies. That is the purpose of all of them, not to generate revenue nearly as much as letting people know this is where we're going. Thank you. Any other questions? I've got Councilman Fazillo. Uh, just a couple. I think a lot of them were covered already previously, but Larry, in 0809, the uh, dollars per account seems to be significantly higher than 09, 10, and 10, 11. Are we, are we, were we shrinking the timeline before we turned them off? Uh, it looks like there was more money outstanding per account back then. Are we, or and let's make sure I ask the question. Are we shrinking the timeline? And that's why the, the dollar and the, and the cost per, you know, per account is shrinking. It, 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 am I drawing, is that a good conclusion? Um, I think also that 0809, we uh, made a more concentrated effort to uh, keep up on those. And I think that might be part of it also that made it, made the higher balance ones um, just kind of jump out. Okay. Uh, the other just scenario is if owner leaves and owes money, and the same owner turns and rents the property out under that scenario, can we hold it up because the owner still owns the property? Or would that still be under the new legislation? We still couldn't go after the owner even though he still owns the property because the renter is the one actually in uh, I'm possession. Give, I'll give you my guess and then the city attorney can look <laughs> at this there. But as I read the the, the statutes in that, it said that we cannot hold someone responsible for someone else's bill. So if the owner was the cause of it, I'm not convinced that we could require it before it came through. Uh, in other words, before the renter's service could be turned on. That doesn't mean, though, if it was on the owner, we still could file, be it a lien on the property or other collection type action on that owner at that point in time. Okay. Yes. Well, I, I think I agree with you. Look at the statute. It says you can't refuse service to anyone other than who incurred the, the expense. It, it's aimed to protect the property owner who rents it out, but I think in that scenario, the same would hold true. Okay, but we could still file a lien since the owner on the property owned it. We could still file a lien on the property. We could. Okay. Any other questions? Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Pizzillo? Aye. Councilmember Loritano? Aye. Councilmember Campbell? Aye. Councilmember Gilzer? Aye. Councilmember Sousa? Aye. Councilmember Osborne? Aye. Vice uh, Mayor Lord? Aye. Passes 7 0. <laughs> okay, we're on number two. Do, uh, did you read that before? Or would you read it now? Now. All right, thank you. Adopt resolution 11 1427, declaring as public record that certain document filed with the city clerk and entitled Ordinance 11 1238, amending Chapter 12 sewers and Chapter 14 water of the Goodyear City Code. So, do we need to do what is the next motion. one? Motion. Pardon me? A motion. Could I hear a motion, please? Move the adoption of the resolution. Second. 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 I heard a motion by Councilman Sousa, <coughs> second by Councilman P uh, Vice Mayor Pazillo. Councilmember Loritano? Aye. Councilmember Campbell? Aye. Councilmember Gilzer? Aye. Councilmember Sousa? Aye. Councilmember Osborne? I think I messed up my numbers here. Are we on C? No. no Aye. It's confusing Thank you. On that. Vice mm -hmm. Mayor Pizzillo? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. Passes 7 0. Okay. C. Right now we're on C. All right. Thank you. 
increase, the fee increase for deposits on new rental, residential water and wastewater service accounts. Recommendation is to conduct a public hearing to increase the residential waste and wastewater deposit fee. We're opening the public hearing and Larry Lang will present. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, the proposal before you on uh, this particular item is, um, there we go, just sometimes I gotta hold this to probably maybe ground me a little bit. Uh, the proposal that we have before you is to increase the water and wastewater deposit fee. Currently that fee is at $100 and this will increase that fee to $225. The average amount owed at the time of disconnection on delinquent utility bills has been estimated at $290. However, as you can see, there's a broad range of what those outstanding amounts are, from $180 to $690. Uh, we, uh, as a staff, may work in the future to reduce the timelines for disconnections. That would be a staff-driven issue. Uh, while we would like to be able to reduce the timelines, we also are very intense in our communications with our customers and want to make sure that our customers know what is happening, and that would be part of the analysis that we would include in there. Why are we considering um, doing this? These would be attempts to um, um, mitigate losses uh, for those delinquent accounts that maybe aren't paying today. Uh, clearly, we want to stay within the intent of House Bill 2450 and House Bill 2193. Um, and as we've talked to our sister cities, they have done similar uh, types of, of uh, reactions both to the legislation as well as updating the amounts outstanding. The chart that I have on the screen right now shows the uh, comparable amounts, deposit amounts in other cities. Uh, they range from $75 in Chandler, uh, who does differentiate between owner-occupied and rental properties, uh, to $225, which is what uh, the Goodyear proposal is and is the amount that is charged uh, currently in Peoria. Um, some of these are also in the process of change. For example, Buckeye is looking at changing certain portions of their deposits, but those haven't been determined yet. That's going through a work session process with them. You'll notice the second column shows those customers or those uh, <coughs> communities that allow the waiver with good credit. And then the, the um, uh, third column shows those that have or are proposing increases as a result of this legislation. Some considerations uh, to look at in this. Uh, it's um, important to still charge potentially um, risky uh, customers, um, and that benefits all of the customer base. If, uh, if, the, if you have higher write-offs, of course, that means that the, the broader um, base has to um, collect more. Although I will say on that particular item in the discussions that we had with one of the uh, legislators this session, before the session started actually, November or December, as he looked at cities uh, with very comparable delinquency rates as we outlined um, in our charts, there wasn't a lot of sympathy with loss ratios below 1% for what those losses are. Um, the, the code that was just adopted allows uh, provisions for the waiver of the deposit, um, owner guarantees if they are, or I think one of the bigger additions is to allow 
payments by, by installments. This chart is the exact same chart that we showed you just a couple of minutes ago. We want to do a little bit as you look at this chart is overlay this chart with you. I'm, I'm going to do this verbally. I apologize. I don't have a good graphic for it because it's a little busy as it is. But by calendar year foreclosures in good year going back, and these were completed foreclosures, not filings, but actually completed. So one house could have had two or more foreclosures in that time <coughs> frame. In calendar year 2007, that number was 279. Uh, calendar year 2008, that number went up to 1,087. Calendar year 2009, that number went up to 1,328. And uh, calendar year 2010, that was 1,055. Um, I think the trend that, as, uh, that we can all see as the economy changed, as the value of houses dropped, uh, and those types of things that the, the delinquencies did increase um, over that period of time. And with that, you know, that was <coughs> very brief, and there's probably a few questions, but I'll turn it over to you to questions. We want to ask for I public, don't have any no public cards. comment. And I need to close the hearing before we talk. Yes. We're closing public hearing. I ask the clerk to read the resolution by title only. Adopt resolution 11 1428, establishing water and sewer deposit fees to recover costs associated with providing water service and sewer service and providing an effective date. Council discussion? Um, motion first. Oh, I'm sorry. Could I hear a motion to second, please? So moved. Second? I'll second. second. Okay. Motion by Councilman Gelzer, second by Councilman Souza. Council discussion? Councilman at Laura Tano? Uh, yeah, I just have a question. When, when you're showing us that some of the accounts are up to $600, is that water usage in a, a month period? That, that those would be the, that high, or is that be the couple months it took to shut it off? Uh, the $690 would be a cumulated balance over a period of time. That wouldn't be a one-month account. And with under the, the program, when people were near the shutoff, they get the letter, they have to make their account current and if, if they're current customers, because they wouldn't have this deposit necessarily in place now, um, then they have to, after the third time, they have to put down that additional deposit? That's correct. Um, we, not, not necessarily, not automatically but that is something that we can require of them uh, that on the third time will require them to put a deposit. I talked to uh, several cities have actually implemented this um, as they've implemented changes from House Bill 2450. I talked to one of the cities and I said, okay, now tell me how that's worked. Um, and, you know, because a customer that's delinquent is not necessarily doing it for any reasons other than cash flow. <coughs> and so now all of a sudden it gets higher. And the intent there, and I thought it really made a lot of sense, is that the intent for that customer that is falling behind, and we're going through this exercise constantly, is a, a kind of an, an informational item to them that says, well, if your account com comes back a third time, that we can charge you for the deposit before we'll turn the water off. And generally, it'll probably happen in connection with turning your water back on that that deposit would be required. Can they make a payment with Visa or MasterCard, or does it have to be cash or cash uh, or something? We do accept credit cards for these payments. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Councilwoman Canville? I have uh, just one comment. Um, we're, we're more than doubling our fee our deposit fee. Um, we want to encourage people to move to Goodyear and to live here, whether they own a home or they rent a home. Um, I'm, I'm just a little concerned that we're adding an additional expense to them for sewer and water, $225 on top of everything else, of all the deposits. Generally, it's first and last month's rent. It's a security deposit. I mean, I do agree with you, we need to raise our deposit requirement, 
but I'm not sure that we need to go to 225 a month. I mean, for just the deposit. I'm just a little concerned. Um, Mayor Lord and Council Member Campbell, um, I think that that's a very valid point, and I think in the work session that that very point was discussed, and I leave that to uh, this group to do that. I do want to just remind you that the average account that we had had a balance of two hundred and ninety dollars, and that's only one variable in 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 that equation. Councilwoman Osborne. Thank you. Well, you all heard my comments. <laughs> about I remember a month your ago. comments. <laughs> Uh, and, and you know what, looking at this, you know, thank you, Larry, for the presentation. I mean, I really can't argue with the logic of your numbers. I understand that. Um, it's also very obvious that the foreclosures played a huge role in this situation. Uh, but, you know, I, I do agree with um, Council Member Campbell that uh, I don't feel comfortable with a, a two and a quarter um, times per, you know, increase. And, uh, you, you mentioned installments, and I feel good about that, that, that you or can go three months, $75 installment, whatever it was. So scenario, if someone had originally not had put down a deposit and they lost their job, hardships came on, whatever it may be, um, now it would take three times of their um, bill being delinquent or, or to the point of shut off before they had to put a deposit. It was delinquency, right? That would be correct. Okay, so three delinquencies within a year, and then um, their water's turned off. Now, uh, to to turn it back on, would they have to pay the full install, the full 225, or would that be allowed to be put on installments? I mean, if they had to pay a, I don't even know what the turn on, turn on back on fee is. What is that? Uh, there's a turn on fee. I believe it's fifty five dollars. Okay, so, 50. so, I'm sorry, 50? 50. Okay, so 50 plus, now, my question, do they get to do the 225 in an installment, or are we going to be tacking on $50 plus 225 plus their, you know, past due bill? Uh, as, as the code was written, um, and as we proposed it to you, that the words on that deposit were may. And therefore, I think we have the flexibility as a staff that if, if we're going to do that, we have the flexibility to accept it in those three month deposits in the same fashion that we would in a new customer. Again, the goal of that provision is not to collect any more additional deposits. The goal of that provision is to get, to keep customers from getting to that point. Correct. Well, I still agree with Councilmember Campbell. I, I, I know we need to, de we have to have a deposit. I'm not saying get rid of the deposit. I think 225 is high. I would have been happier with 175 myself. Um, I think 225 is just too harsh. Any other comments? Yeah, uh, question. Vice Mayor Bezello. Uh, scenario of uh, foreclosure in a bank Takes, pay, takes it back over, would they be required to put up a $225 deposit, get the water turned on? I, I somehow think the bank can come up with a letter of credit and <laughs> we'll be good. Uh, if they, let's say for them to get a letter of credit, they would have to actually have some utility accounts, I, I guess somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think generally you think they, they would. Um, okay. I, I would. I would probably make a fairly broad assumption that they've got good credit. Okay. You know, I like the idea that there's flexibility. I am also somewhat concerned, especially for in, the, in these times, you know, as far as the 225. Um, I know we're trying to collect the money, and I know we want to make sure that we've got that on there. But I know there's possibly some young families coming in as well that $225 may be a lot of money for them. Um, and I do know we want to capture our cost as well. Um, and I do like the flexibility. But, you know, I, I would like to maybe see a little, little less than that. I, I know that I know the logic, and I agree with the logic. But uh, you know, I'm kind of thinking of the young families trying to come in, um, and uh, from a deposit standpoint. So that's kind of where I'm at. Any other comments? Yeah, I, I have. Councilman Gelser. One question, and then a general comment. Um, could you enlighten us on how we handle sanitation-only accounts? Do we would this affect? 
would this be similar? Um, or how do, how do we, you know, if, if you live south of I-10, you get sanitation and water from the city, and this deposit will go to cover public works. If you live north of I-10, you just get sanitation. How do we handle that? Um, as far as the deposit portion north of I-10, we're not proposing uh, a deposit at this point in time for one very <laughs> simple reason, and I'm the holdup on it. Um, by the way, I live south of I-10, so that's not why, but uh, the very reason is, is I have not been able to have anyone explain to me a logical way we can administer it uh, for those customers north of I-10. Do they don't, we don't turn their water on, we don't turn their water off. While customers are required to uh, uh, sign up for service, uh, those that sign up voluntarily probably are going to show, show the letter of support. We have customers that don't want the service um, at all, that, or they don't want to pay for the service, they don't sign up for the service, and then to come in with a process there that says, well, now you need to come in, fill out an application, show us a credit letter, or do a deposit. Mechanically, I just struggle with it. Okay. We okay. have the code authority in the previous adoption. Of the okay, let me follow up, Larry. Are you saying to me that we have residential people who live in Goodyear who have refused to, to participate in sanitation services and have said, I don't want it and I'm not putting my trash out? They, we have had, yeah, in sanitation services, where they're sanitation only, we have had any combination of those types of disputes with customers, yes. I think I've gotten and, a few of those phone calls. And I'm how sure. many, and how many <laughs> customers have we identified? I'd have to look up up there. The number of customers, because of efforts, uh, and I really have to comment on the efforts from the sanitation department that have worked very hard to try to get all of those. They're followed up with letters to those customers, um, and we've expanded. I want to say that currently we have some 5,000 customers up there. Does that sound about right that are sanitation only? Um, and that number has increased significantly in the past um, couple, three years uh, due to the efforts from our sanitation department. Um. Could I, could I direct a question to the city manager? Do we have any program where we check for occupancy against delinquent accounts or non-existent accounts? Uh, I think I'll answer that. That is exactly, we, we, we look for occupancy. We look for whether or not they have service in the water company. We will uh, go- From Lipsco. Get, yeah, from Liberty Water. We actually, I believe we still purchase the uh, records from them of who has water service, uh, looking at occupancy and so forth. Uh, so between the sanitation department and code enforcement, um, this is something that they're working on consistently. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to make a comment that um, a typical business relationship 80% of your efforts are generated by 10 to 20% of your problem, your problem accounts. And I am gonna be supporting this deposit um, as presented by staff, because I really don't think that the rest of the citizens should have to deal with, you know, cover the problems of people who are basically, I guess I don't want deadbeats to move to Goodyear. Councilman Loretano. Mm -hmm. I, I hear what um, Council Member Campbell and P Vice Mayor Pazillo and Council Member Osborne saying and, and thinking of that is maybe we need to look at a two-tier system. One tier maybe at the 175 for people who maybe have not established credit but they haven't proved to be a bad credit risk and then maybe the 225 for the people that are the bad credit risks because I, I don't think you should reward the people who are the bad credit risk the same. I do, I do agree with Council Member Gelzer with that. If you do a two-tiered system with the, the fee or would this cause havoc with the computer, I don't know. That's just my thoughts. Um, you know, I, I look at this a little bit differently. I, uh, tell me, because um, Councilman Gelzer hit upon that, uh, essentially these people are costing, uh, are raising the, uh, 
amount that a regular customer would have to pay. I mean, it all goes into a utility which runs the utility service. So we really are penalizing, in a sense, the people that pay their bills. Is, is that assumption correct? I mean, in the, in the every, bigger picture. Yes, yes. every uh, account that we have to charge off is a business expense of our utilities. Our rates, as you know, actually as, as you have mandated, uh, are, have to be self-sufficient so that that, and it, and it, that unit can, can uh, support itself. So therefore, it is a business expense yes. and that so is paid for by all of the rates. By the rest of the citizens who pay their bills on time, even in difficult times, they come through to pay their bills. Um, the other thing, a two-tiered system, uh, I would assume that that's going to add a little bit more expense on, um, on the city to do a two-tier, a two -tier, because you've got different notifications, you've got... I would want to research a two-tiered system and the administrative aspects of it uh, before you were to adopt it so that I could report right. back to you on that. Um, what I worry about <coughs> is, is if we're not catered to doing it, if we could administer it without error and make sure we get the right person or deposit back and so forth. And I don't know the answer. And I have a tendency to feel the same way that Councilman Gelzer does. I'm in support of this. And I understand why our city has to have these type of fees in order to um, compensate for the loss of revenue uh, that ends up um, paid off other taxpayers' pockets. So, any other comments? Just, oh, just, me. just one real quick. You know, and again, I, I appreciate the logic in the 225. My concern is <coughs> your write-offs are less than 1%. You're going to be collecting deposits on new people coming in that probably are not going to have a problem. So again, they could be young families just coming in, and you're going to get 225 from them, and there may be a stretch for them, even though you do have some possibilities of, of stretching out three payments or whatever. And again, I want to make sure the city gets this entire you know dollar amount. But I'd like to see the city and see if there's a way we can close some of that turnoff for those notices a little bit to maybe shrink, you know, some of that outstanding dollars as well. And I don't know what it takes to do that with a little quicker turnaround because you mentioned the time they get the service till the time, you know, they actually, you know, you pull the plug. There's quite a few days in there. And I know, you know, being in, in that environment, I know it's not the easy. It's easier said than done. But, you know, I think there's some value if we try to try to shrink those down as well. But, but yet yeah, my, my concern with the 225 is, is the newer ones trying to come in and locate. The ones that will probably pay, maybe just getting their first line of service, don't have the credit established, and we're going to hit them for 225. So... Um, I, I like the idea. I think it has to be more than 100, but I, I'm not sure I can, I can support the 225. Well, I would like to comment, please. Councilman. Councilman. Um, mm -hmm. 3,500 for foreclosures. I, I take exception to the word deadbeats in Goodyear because I, I, don't, I don't find that many people are deadbeats. And we've gone through a recession, and so I, I, under, I understand the logic. And like I said, I can't argue the logic here. Um, but I, I still believe that uh, there's a better number. And um, I mean, I, I would propose an, a, an amendment to this um, ordinance of, of 175 for the deposit rather than 225. I just, it's just something that I guess is, is more of a, um, not a logical response. <laughs> but uh, it's something that uh, our economy, our citizens, our, our state has faced. Well, now we're in a dilemma. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you re the rebuttal is if you go back to the um, chart of our comparable cities. Could you put that, Larry? Can you go back um, to that and put it up on Avondale the Avondale charges $175 but does not waive their fee. So everybody gets to pay the deposit. We, on the other hand, are charging a little bit more for people who have not very good credit and we're taking, we're assuming the risk, and we're basically waiving this fee for the 85 to 90 percent of the people that are, you know, good citizens who pay their bills on time. What percentage, is, what percentage is waived? I mean, how many? What percentage of people do get the waiver? I guess. I 
I'd, I'd hate to estimate. Um, I will tell you there was one time when I signed up for service where they asked me for a utility letter, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I don't want to fill one out, and I think I paid the deposit. But I would think most customers would be able to get that letter. Larry, can you talk a little bit closer to the microphone? I'm sorry. I apologize, um, Mayor Lord, uh, Council Member Loritano. Um, I can't answer directly. I don't know the percentage. It is a minority uh, percentage uh, that is not waived. The majority is waived. Uh, I know one time I was saying, one time I signed up for service at one time, didn't bother getting a letter. I needed to get that taken care of, amongst other things, and I just paid the deposit and moved on. And do we count phone service and cable service as well as part of a utility? That's correct. So we Cox would. communication could be considered or your phone service could also be considered? I, I believe so, correct, Tony? Cox? Okay. Water, electric, and gas for the benefit of everyone. Madam, Madam Mayor, yes. proce uh, procedurally you have an amendment on the floor. You need to call for a second. Second. I hear a second by Councilwoman Campbell. So I. Uh, so you can discuss the amendment and then you'll need to take a vote on the amendment before right. moving back to the main motion. All right, let's discuss the amendment. Is there an amendment? You have an amendment to reduce the deposit to $175. Discussion on it? So now we vote. Separately on that before yeah. we vote for the. That's correct. You vote on the amendment first. All, right. all in favor. Well, let's see where we're. Oh, all in favor. It's not a roll call. Uh, I ask for a roll call. Yes. I'd like a roll call, please. The amendment. the amendment, whether to reduce it from uh, to one seventy five. Okay. Councilmember Campbell. Aye. Councilmember Gilzer. No. Councilmember Sousa. No. Councilmember Osborne. Aye. Vice Mayor Pizzillo. Aye. Councilmember Loritano? No. Mayor Lord? Aye. Wait a minute, nay. What am I voting? I'm voting for the, I'm voting against this. Yeah. It fails 4-3. Okay. So where are we now? Hey, back to your main motion. Okay. So I guess we can, uh, we've already asked for a motion and a second on that, so roll call. Councilmember Gelzer? Aye. Councilmember Sousa? Aye. Councilmember Osborne? Nay. Vice Mayor Pizzillo? Nay. Councilmember Loritano? Nay. Councilmember Campbell? Nay. Mayor Lord? Aye. Bales 4 3. I'm over to you, Roy. <laughs> well, at this point, you're back to your deposit of $100. So that's the result of the vote. Unless there's a motion to reconsider made by somebody in the minor in the prevailing vote if you wanted to consider another number this evening. I would make a motion to reconsider to 200. Well, first you need to motion, make a motion to reconsider. Oh, sorry. Motion oh, to reconsider. All right. Motion is made to reconsider. Do I have can a I, second? Can I second it or not? I think I believe it has to be somebody in the majority. In the other side. Okay. Do I hear a second? There's no, well, this is what we're looking for is to reduce it to, what was it? I wrote it down so I could, I made the motion. Yeah. Councilwoman Laura Tano made the motion to lower it. To 200. No, to, no, re to no, reconsider, reconsider. Reco Oh, to reconsider, to reconsider it at 200. No, just, oh, to, just reconsider. to reconsider it. Then you can discuss a number. Take the number away, to I, reconsider yeah. it. Just to reconsider. Because I thought you said a number. I, I did, but she I She said a number, so that's why. She did, but the, All right. Okay, Does I'll say I to reconsider. Okay, that's all, that's your motion. Just to reconsider, though. That's, that's my correct. motion. Thank you. So okay. now you just take a vote on whether to reconsider. So all in favor? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> It'll be all right, Gary. Just take your hand down. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. I know I it's can, a little tense here. I can, I can live so, with 200. It's a little confusing, but we will get through this. All right, so we are where now? We're, we're yeah, 200, 200 is what everybody yeah, wants. Like we can go with another. that. So we open it up to more discussion. More discussion so, than all right. motion. Can we come to some kind of compromise here? Yes. Um, <laughs> Mayor Lord and Campbell. council members and members of the audience. Um, I oppose going to $225 
for the deposit because I'm looking at seniors who are on fixed incomes who may move here to be near their children and they will be required to pay this deposit. It may only be $75 a month in three increments for $225, but that is a lot of money to someone <coughs> who is on a fixed income. I, if we go to $200, we're raising our deposit 100%. And um, while I don't like 225, I'm not real thrilled at 200, and I'm not sure how I'm going to vote on it. But that's that's my. I'm still concerned that it's not just young people <coughs> or newly met, newly weds. It it could be anyone moving to our city who is coming from a depressed area, thinking they can get a better life in Goodyear. If, if we're going to make it too difficult for them to rent in our city, I don't want to do that because I would like them to live in Goodyear and raise their children here or live by their own children. Yes, Councilman Gelser. I, I, I just don't understand why we are adding to our problems by inviting people who create problems to live here. I mean, that, that, that is what you're doing. You, if our current deposit is $100, we lose an average of $290 every time we go through this collection process. Basically, you're asking the rest of the citizens to amortize this amount of money over, why should, you know, why are we asking good, honest, tax-paying, rate-paying, fee-paying citizens to pay for deadbeats. I'm sorry. I can live with 200 if that's what you want. I can live with 175, but I think 100 is, is we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Other comments? Well, I, I agree that the 100 is too low. I, have not, I do not have a problem with raising it. I think 225 is too high, and that's why I suggest the 175. Um, and I, I'm, you know what? I'm going to stick with that 175. If you, if you want to, I appreciate Cherry, you know the compromise there. I do, and um, but I, I'm going to stick with my uh, first. Well, if you would just, um, my comment is, and I'll get to you in a moment, is if you look at the averages of the cities, you look at Buckeye. Now, our income level in Goodyear, I would surmise, far surpasses Buckeye. Is that correct? Does anybody uh, here know the in, normally? It does. Ours is what, 80? Uh, today we had a discussion on it with some gentlemen. Our average income here in Goodyear is $80,000 a year. Um, so now you compare it to Buckeye and they're doing 200. So what you're saying to us is, or in, to me, I'm looking at this, you're saying, well, our community uh, has far less resources. Oh, no, I didn't say that at all. In fact, Buckeye. That's, but that's by, not what but I by said. the number, it is giving me that impression that we have a, a very distressed group here in Pebble Creek as opposed to other areas. And so if we look through down through some of the other areas, uh, we've got Glendale um, and uh, average income there. I think we're higher than Glendale. Um, you look at Mesa. You look at Mesa's a little bit higher, uh, Peoria. So uh, Phoenix, I think it's interesting uh, that it, the uh, – level they're having problems with their budget that they would have something like $83 uh, for the utilities. It'd be interesting to find out why. Um, and Scottsdale has a two-month average. So what do you suppose a two-month average is in, in Scottsdale, Arizona? Ranges from $89 to $600 for Scottsdale, depending on the property's billing history. So it is variable. <coughs> if you, if you probably average that out, I would assume it'd be around the 200. If you've got as high as 600, uh, Councilwoman Loretana. I, I kind of voted no on both of them because 
I, I do agree with, with both sides, and that's why I kind of suggested a, a two-tier type system, but failing that, because I know there's the account answer, so I didn't know if it would be an accounting nightmare. Um, I think we do have to keep in mind that people from coming from other places, you said you even accept Canadian um, proof of payment or, or any sort of proof of payment from other jurisdictions. So if I'm coming from Massachusetts and I paid my water bill in Massachusetts or my electric bill, then that is sufficient for this, right? That is correct. Okay, so, uh, it, and I do understand being in a family because when I moved to Goodyear, I was just out of law school, and I'm trying to remember if, if, I, if I have a deposit down or not. I, I don't recall. I believe at my first house I had to have a deposit because I paid rent that included all my utilities for three years in law school, so I did have to come in, although I had perfect credit at the time. Um, so I, I do understand that. That's why I kind of looked at where the other averages hit and, um, and, and see $200 sufficient. Um, I, I, I think maybe it's something we, we look at, but I, I would also like to get the information further on is what percentage are we actually talking about that put down that deposit? I think that's what's really important because I don't, I think from what you're saying and from what I'm hearing you say, it's not a ton of people, you know, percentage wise, and that that percentage is the majority that would put it down would be the majority of those collection accounts. And, I, and I, I think that's something that, that I would like to know. Um, but I think $200 for me would be a, a fair kind of, it kind of balances the, the, new, the new people in town who may not have that credit history. And maybe we look to expand what a good credit letter could include, if it could include Quest service or Cox service, because those are utilities as well. And, and, and I think what we're looking for is if people are paying then it should be waived. If you have good credit and if you're paying your phone, your electric, all your bills, you should get a, a benefit. But I think we need to protect our citizens. I agree 100% with, count, with um, Council Member Gelser and, and the mayor that we just can't have everyone else. Unfortunately, you know, there are people working two to three jobs to make sure that they pay their bills and you can't have them pay more. So that's why I kind of looked at where this was. I voted no because I thought the 225 was a little high. Um, it's not a ton of relief, but for me, when I'm seeing Glendale, Buckeye, a majority are around the 200 mark, I, I think that puts us pretty much in the ballpark. So I'll vote yes if it's agreed at 200. Mayor? Uh, yes, Vice Mayor Bazell. I, I, can, I can go with the 200. Again, my biggest, my biggest concern, number one, is I'd like to see us work to try to shrink that timeline, you know, for turnoffs, because I think if we do, we can keep the exposure a little smaller. I, I know, you know, you're gonna have to take a look at the process to see how you can do that. But I think if you can shrink the timeline, our exposure will drop, you know, from the from the cutoff. And again, my concern's always been those that don't have it. I'm, you know, and again, with the with the recession or whatever, I, I really find sometimes there are people who fall themselves into positions, unfortunately, that, you know, that are out of control. And I know we gotta protect ourselves. I'm a numbers guy, so I realize the, the, the deposit you're looking at. But I think there's two ways we can look at it. We can kind of shrink the timeline to try to mitigate some of our exposure. And, and again, I, I, can, I can live with the two. Even though I know it's only 25, I, 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 I think I can live with the two. Any other comments? <coughs> Called compromise. Oh, I know it is. I know it is. Um, you know, something that, that occurs to me that um, is, is kind of on a different uh, level, and Rourke, stop me if I go too far, but if, if you sit there looking at fees, we're talking about a fee that is, is less than 1% of our citizens, but yet fees that we continue to um, take on by a city are false alarm fees. And um, that's something we're all paying for also. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that our citizens pay for um, as, as a group. And, uh, and so I, I, I don't like the fact that we're, we're calling less than 1% of people that have gone through hardships, have gone through foreclosures, deadbeats. Um, I also don't appreciate the, the comparison to Buckeye because that's not what I was implying whatsoever. But um, I can compromise with 200, but, I, but my feeling regarding this entire situation stands with there's always going to be time that our community realizes that people go through hard times. And um, 
and that's what the human race is about. And so I'll, I'll be willing to go with this 200, but at the end of this evening, I'm going to be asking for something. <laughs> Any other comments? Yeah, Madam Mayor, you're, you're going to need a motion to approve Resolution 11-1428 establishing the proposed deposit for sewer and water at 200 is what I've heard. Okay. So you'll be looking for that motion. Yes. I'd, I'd like to move that the council adopt resolution 11-1428 as read by the clerk with a revised deposit of $200 when required by the city finance department. Second motion. We've had a motion by uh, Councilman Gelzer and second by <laughs> Councilman Souza. And could we do a roll call vote on this, please? Councilmember Sousa? Aye. Councilmember Osborne? Aye. Vice Mayor Pizzillo? Aye. Councilmember Loritano? Aye. Councilmember Campbell? No. Councilmember Gelzer? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. Passes 6-1. Before we go to the next item, I just want to make a comment, if this is all right. I, I want to thank the council. Um, this was a deep discussion. Um, and please do not take any remarks personally. Um, this, is, this is how you come to consensus. It took us a while to get, get there. Um, and in the beginning, I didn't think we were going to make it, but we did. So this is what a good council does. So I thank and congratulate each one of you for this discussion this evening. And Larry, thank you very much for your patience. All right, Ron D, is that correct? Am I all set here? All right, uh, extend city leases for parking and office space at the Venita Business Park. Then the Beals will present. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Linda Beals. I'm the real estate coordinator here at the City of Goodyear. Um, I'm here to present an item um, that we brought back to you. Um, it was initially brought to you on the April 11th agenda. We have modified the terms since then, um, partially at least at the direction of council, and I think we went a little further in a positive direction, so um, hopefully um, what we have to present today will be um, a positive thing. Um, I wanted to give you a very brief history, hopefully, of what has gone on with the Veneta buildings. Um, as most of you are probably aware, back in the early 2000s, we were experiencing significant growth, and that growth overwhelmed our city facilities. Because of that, we looked at an interim solution so we could get our city center built, and the interim solution that we was landed on was to move here to Veneta. Um, partially, um, some of the reasoning behind that was there really was a very limited amount of leasing available, these buildings were available, and we set up leasing for, um, we, like I say, our, because of the overcrowding, um, certain portions of the city moved over into initially buildings D and E. Um, that was the community development and the public safety portions. And the initial term was uh, 3.25 years and seven days. Some of the oddness of that term was based on um, the fact that uh, it had to do with when the starting date started. <laughs> and again, the term was kind of thinking ahead of that with the options that were available, was thinking ahead of when we thought we were going to be able to hopefully get moving toward a city center development. Um, also, we're moving on to Veneta Building B. That one was leased in May of 2008. For those of you who don't recall, our justice facility was completely overwhelmed. We had people working literally in spaces that were incredibly small, like closets and sharing closets. Um, we had our council meetings where we literally um, used to take turns coming into seat in the, the room. Um, we keep our developers outside, and then when their item would come up, some, some nights we'd literally bring them in, and we'd take turns. Um, that's how crowded we were at times. So moving over here clearly was a much nicer option um, and I think a much more professional looking and it, it, it made us look um, like the first class city that we really are. So um, again, we rented this, this portion of the facility for five years and 
four months initially. Um, again, I think some of the odd term was based on when the leases got started and trying to mesh leases together. Moving on, I'll try to keep this relatively brief, but the, the amount of space that we lease over in building D is 35,978 square feet, um, and D and E, I'm sorry, and here over here we have 18,495 square feet. I show the terms, um, the dates again. Initial rate on building D and E, that was in the high portion of the market, was $18.60 a square foot. Um, with the rent being 55,000, the base rent being 55,765 <coughs> and change. These are triple net leases where we pay almost all the expenses. And the escalation on that rent was 3%. <coughs> Again, we were in a very <coughs> moving market. Um, we also pay because we have and we utilize additional space beyond what you would typically utilize in this type of a complex. We have our personal vehicles in the parking lot. We have we have our, our business vehicles in the parking lot, and we also have nights like tonight when we're bringing in council and so forth. So our parking needs are, and again, and these buildings have a much higher population than you would normally see of employees in these type of buildings. So we utilize a much larger amount of parking that would traditionally be used in this type of a building. We also have some covered parking, um, and if employees choose to use that, they, they pay for that additional fee. Um, and I believe that there's, there's some that are set out for directors and so forth, which is similar to what we have at the IOB um, or the interim office building over on Litchfield. The building B that we're in, the market had come down by the time we leased building B. Um, we went with a longer term on this building due to the fact that we don't have any significant plans on when we're going to move out of this facility, so we did go with a longer initial rent on this one. And you see the rate was lower, $16.45 a square foot, which actually was a pretty good rate at that time, considering that the build-out on this building is actually a nicer build-out than we have on the other building. So the cost incurred by, um, and that build-out was, was taken on mostly by the, the owner. So um, you also, to compare them, would have to understand that the cost to the landlord was higher on this, this portion of the building. Um, again, initial rent twenty seven thousand six sixty five forty four, um, and we have an, we have a situation where we get one free month a year, and I think it was due to budgeting reasons at that time. Again, triple net, again with three percent annual increases. Moving on um, to what has what we really has transpired in the last few weeks. Um, we have extended the, t or we're proposing an extension of the term um, out to 2016 on both buildings. The initial rate on the buildings D and E um, is $15 a square foot. That is even lower than where we started at initially and significantly lower than what we're paying right now. Um, what we're looking at is rental escalations of 2.5%. Um, and we, again, the parking we have lowered back down to closer to what we started with, with 2% escalations where it used to have 3% also. Building B, we've extended the term out an additional two years. The initial rate looks higher, but it's not. It actually is the same as building D and E. The reason it looks higher is because when I say the initial rate, I'm showing the initial rate on the extended term that starts in 2014. So what you're going to see is building D&E at the 2.5% <coughs> escalations will meet, will come up to 1639 and those are the, we're going to be paying the same rate on all the buildings at that point in time. Again, you'll note the terms are the same. Um, the rent, the, t the ending terms, the rent escalation is 2.5% on both. Um, and the one thing that we did change is the initial lease for building B required us to continue leasing all of the extended, the ex extended parking through the term of, even if D&E went away, we were going to continue to lease all of the extended parking. I didn't think that that seemed reasonable and I talked to the owner and negotiated that although we may need some additional parking for the court and, and council, but we won't need all of it. So we're going to cut that in. We're going to allow it to be cut in half. 
The likely time when that's going to happen is if we do utilize the option periods. And if D&E &E, &E go away and we move to city center and we go ahead and continue here for another two years during the option periods, then we would, we would utilize that option. This is essentially my last slide. Um, you're going to notice if the numbers are a tad different than on the council action form that I put in, the savings is actually higher. And that's because on the council action form, um, I didn't really, um, I noted that I didn't have the entire extended parking fee in there. And so the, the actual fees are a little bit higher on what we'll be paying on, on the rent because we do have to pay for that extended parking. But the good news is, is that we also are saving money on that extended parking. Um, we're going to be saving over what we would have been paying under our cur current lease options. Because one thing I haven't explained is our old existing leases both had options. And we could have continued living under those options. Um, we chose not to because those options were significantly higher than what we <coughs> have negotiated now. Vanita. D&E under the option conditions would have had us at $51,849. You can see the new monthly rent is significantly lower at $44,972. That's a monthly savings over what we would have been paying of $6,800 or almost $6,900, which is an annual savings of $82,000. Vanita B has a, an odd situation with that weird free month rent, so the math won't quite work across that column if anybody tries it. but. The savings annually on Vanita B is $2,935.79. The other thing I haven't noted is, oh, and something I didn't mention, was Vanita B, well, as we know, will be coming down substantially in the year 2014. And because of that, our savings on that particular bill on Vanita B here will go way up from that when we get to that year 14. But for now, it is $2,935. The extended parking is going down now to a savings of 462 a month. Total savings per month under the current, over what we were paying under the current um, proposed leases will bring us down $91,000 a year initially. And over the initial four, term, four years, we'll save $440,000. And if you go out another year, you can kind of play with the math. But the reality is I didn't do the fifth year just because we didn't have options for that year. And that ends my presentation unless, and then I'm going to open for questions. Thank you, Linda. Uh, do we have any comments from the public? I'd like to ask for a motion and a second, please. So moved. Second. I'm sorry, was that uh, Councilwoman? Me. Uh, very thank you, Osborne, and the second by Vice Mayor Pizzillo. Um, so, Council, uh, discussion? I, I believe, uh, you know, in the motion that we sh should actually put in the uh, monthly figure of $44,972.50. These are going to be in the minutes, and uh, I, rather than go through all this to find the Mayor and Council, I'd like to make sure it's clear that if we're going to do that, that it's base rent. Can you talk a little closer to the microphone? I'm sorry. I'd like to make clear that if we're going to be certain on that number, that, that it's very clear that it is base rent. That's what? That it's base rental. Because we also have the common, there's also common area charges with a net lease. So I want to make sure that we make clear that it's a base rental. The posse is better now. Yeah. Well, better than Linda, I, I think they're, they're those dollars are included in the, the lease amendments. It which is, is. What they, you're are, they are specifically the in the lease amendments. Yeah, and you have those documents in your in your right council here. packet. Yeah, I saw that, but uh, having to go through all that to come up with the rate, well, that concerns me, that's okay. You okay? Yeah. All right, thank you. Any other discussion? Um, Could I ask a quick question? Of course you can. Is our, does our Campbell. landlord take care of the maintenance of these buildings? They take care of, there are certain, the maintenance is somewhat split. We take care of, as I recall, the, oh, I'm sorry, Eric is with us tonight. Eric Cornwell is with us. I'm sorry, I meant to mention that, and I got moving a little quickly. Um, the facilities, 
the director is not here, but I believe, and my understanding is, and confirm if I'm wrong, let me know. My, my recollection is we pay everything except we do maintain, I believe, the air conditioning unit. Eric, do you want to? Eric, do you mind coming up? Clark? Thank you. My apologies, Mark Flynn from Public Works. I believe the question related to the maintenance of the Venita complex? Of all the buildings. All, the buildings. all of them that we're leasing. For the Venita complex. Yes. Is what we're referring to this evening. Uh, we, we do have a kind of a split arrangement with, with the Cornwall Corporation. There are components that we manage on a small scale, internal furniture renovations, electrical switching, outlets that may lose power, that kind of thing, resetting breakers. But the larger building systems are managed by the company themselves. There's a, a gentleman on the, the Cornwall Corporation staff who we have a relationship with who manages those components. We provide notice to him of deficiencies that we identify, and then they provide that response and alert us to what those corrective actions are. Do they do that in a timely manner? Very much so, yes. We've had a very good relationship in that fashion. <laughs> Thank you. You're quite welcome. Sorry I wasn't available. No problem. Satisfied? Mm -hmm. uh, Vice Mayor Pizzello. No, I, I appreciate renegotiating, and if I read that correctly, what, 91000 in savings? No, I appreciate that. <laughs> Any other comments? Very nice presentation. Thank you. Um, call for vote, so I can just do all in favor on this one. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Okay, Council, now's the time uh, for comments and uh, events that you've attended. Who would like to start? How about Councilwoman Campbell? Well, thank you. Um, last week I attended the eulogy and the funeral service for Officer Toronto, and I want to take this opportunity to thank the members of the Goodyear Police Department for providing um, the, the service for the service and for whatever they did to help the Buckeye Police Department during this very tragic time. Thank you. Oh, and I also, I'm sorry, I also attended the plume meeting uh, at City Hall um, on Thursday. Good. Councilwoman Osborne? Uh, myself and I believe quite a few of you all attended the Leadership West Regional Conference, yes, and um, uh, Mayor and, and myself attended the um, Arizona Small Business Association Annual Awards um, event last uh, week. But I also, for, for four days in this past week, I was uh, in the um, Arizona Town Hall, and uh, that was um, the 98th session, and it was on uh, capitalizing on arts and culture. So that was very interesting. And sadly, I was also um, at uh, Officer uh, Toronto's uh, funeral. Thank you. Are you all set? Councilman Souza? Done. Thank you. Councilman Lower Town? Um, I attended the Pebble Creek, uh, not the Pebble Creek, the, the car show for the Centennial Committee. And I have to say, uh, <coughs> Councilman for Campbell, you did a great job. And I'm sure you'll make that number quick quicker rather than sooner to get that train depot. I just kudos to the whole committee. Councilman Gelser. Um, I attended the uh, Public Works dedication of the art object at the beautiful art object. It's really cool. At the uh, Roscoe Dork Park and I also went to the car show and barbecue and um, it was that was just an outstanding event and I again want to echo the comments and bravos to Councilwoman Campbell and the rest of the committee. It was great. And lastly, I attended the groundbreaking of the Bradley Academy um, that is in Sarville Village. Thank you, Gary. Were there a number of people there? Staff. There were, Just, the, the, okay. there were um, some of our planning people and some of our ballpark um, staff were there the community outreach people from the ballpark. Okay. So it was good to see them out shaking hands. Great. Well, I have a few announcements to make tonight, okay? So you just bear with me. Um, uh, I noticed in the newspaper that Estrella Foothills High School in Goodyear was named as the 2011 A-plus School of Excellence by the Arizona Educational Foundation. Uh, I think it's really important that we acknowledge that. The Buckeye Union District School is among 25 Arizona schools that were honored. 
the A Plus Award is valid for three years. The A Plus School of Excellence program celebrates education and calls attention to the positive stories and successes occurring in Arizona's public school in every day, the EF, AEF Executive Director Bobby O'Boyle said. A Plus schools are evaluated on student focus and support, school culture, active teaching and learning curriculum, leadership, community, and parent involvement. You hear that parent involvement, that's nice to hear, and assessment data. Winning schools serve as models of educational excellence based on information provided by the winning schools. AEF compiles database of A plus best practices and this is available to see on the website. So I just, kudos, kudos to that school. Um, you know, it's sort of sad, some of the things that you have to attend. I attended Sergeant Garcia's funeral. He is the uh, sergeant uh, that uh, was killed in Afghanistan. And uh, the family uh, welcomed us and, and was so pleased that Goodyear was represented. And also I attended the officers, tri tri Triados and the Buckeye police that was killed. and. That was a pretty magnificent uh, celebration of his life and uh, on his accomplishments. Uh, of course, many of us attended, and we have to say this, the pre-grand uh, opening of Freddy's Frozen Custard. <laughs> and uh, it was a treat for all of us. Uh, never tasted custard like that before. Absolutely outstanding. Uh, I attended the MAG Regional Council meeting. I attended the Leadership West Summit and actually was on the panel. I attended the Westmark Str Strategic Planning Session. I welcomed new hires at our orientation this week and that, and that was a delight to do. Um, I attended the Southware Mayor's Breakfast where we had uh, Barry Broom from GPEC as the guest. Um, I also, um, I held, for all of you, you know I've talked to you about the business breakfasts that we're going to have and for the people sitting in the audience, we. We wanted to dispel some of the uh, dialogue that was going out in the election year about Goodyear not being business friendly. Although tonight, when you heard our businessmen get up and speak, they certainly didn't say that, did they? But there are people that have felt that way. So uh, we decided to uh, hold business breakfast. And, and what we're doing on the larger companies, we're inviting three <coughs> business companies in to talk with us and staff the city manager, and I'm inviting council members to attend, one or two, depending on who's available. Uh, and then we're just going to reach out to these businesses and find out where we can improve, where their problems lie. So I had my first one, and unfortunately we could only get one business man in at that one because of the time frame, and that was Dave Vallette of the Cancer Treatments of America. And that went very, very well, and we're scheduling more so you can all know that you're going to be called to please come to my office for breakfast so we can talk to them. And on the smaller businesses, we're going to gather them in larger groups um, and uh, have that same discussion. So it's going to take us time, but we're looking forward uh, to accomplishing that. Um, I also attended, and I want to thank uh, Council, uh, Vice Mayor Pazillo uh, for taking the RPTA for me. Uh, and I did attempt to sit in his meeting, and I think I was there five minutes and had to be called out. But thank you very much for representing the city on that. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to the city manager. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, my fault. I, I swear I lost a weekend. Um, I just needed to, to thank staff, and um, I actually missed the great centennial uh, celebration and the car show. I. I Drove over there quickly, trying to to go give support, and I was 10 minutes from my lead, my teen's leadership graduation. And I just wanted to thank staff because not only for my Y12 program, um, which is uh, leadership training for teenagers, I had great speakers. Um, I've I've had great cooperation and collaborations with the city, and I just really appreciate all all you guys have done uh, for the leadership of of our growing teams and for the last six years, this was our, our sixth graduating class, so I really appreciate that. Can I say something? Yes, please. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm so neglectful to, to tell you how wonderful the Centennial Committee's barbecue and car show was on Saturday, but unfortunately we had such a busy week and so much was going on, I, I apologize not to, to thank our wonderful park and recreation staff, the staff at the ballpark, um, Parish, everybody that helped us put this uh, wonderful event on. We had over 2,000 people come. 
Uh, we sold out of barbecue. Mr. Softy was there. We had uh, 100 or 200 cars that were gorgeous. We were covered in the newspaper and we made money. And Paula Lardo needs a big thank you because right. she and her department and Michael, they all helped us pull it together. And it was just wonderful. We hope that this will just be the start of having an annual event um, because we, uh, we just, it, it was so great. And we had four high schools that brought their jazz bands out and played with their parents and they were so well received. So it really was an event that was all community and we just thank all of you so very much. Thank you, I also attended and it was fun finding out the car that I thought was best. Yes, yes. thank you very much. Mayor? Uh, oh, can I get yes. the kudos out as well? Yes, please. Um, we had a, a one of our newer residents who moved down here from Canada had, a, we were just talking about water and the water bill and everything. And I don't know her last name, but Nancy in the finance department was, I guess, a stellar, wonderful help. So I wanted to <laughs> let Larry know that. That's nice. And I also had favorable comments about some of the building inspectors, although I don't have their names, but very, very helpful. So that's wonderful to hear. Thank you. Any other comments we have? Not from us, I'm sorry, from the city manager. Madam Mayor, members of the council, just a couple of items. One is as a reminder for this coming Monday, the 16th. We will be doing another budget work session that starts at four o'clock. We will be getting you on Friday this week, we will be getting you a copy of the PowerPoint presentation so you have a chance to reflect on that, as well as you're going to get a book. I don't know if it's an inch thick or, but it will have a lot of information in there. And we are calling that our draft tentative budget uh, document. So you'll have that in its entirety. Um, that's the good news. Bad news is it may kill part of your weekend and part of Monday before. And uh, I'm going to Vegas. <laughs> How am I going to take that? <laughs> I just got back from Vegas this weekend. Oh so my it's, gosh. It's, we've already covered that. Um, oh. But uh, anyway, you'll have that in advance. And certainly if they're uh, uh, at 4 o'clock again on May 16th, we'll have a chance to get that back before council. Uh, the following week is when you will be looked upon for tentative budget adoption. So. Uh, this is obviously a very important work session that, that we're having on the 16th. Um, the only follow-up item I had was following up with uh, Mr. Kuzmi, if I pronounce that right. Uh, so we will have uh, primarily public work staff actually get in contact with him to talk about our different standards, especially as it relates to infrastructure, facilities, streets, those types of things. So when we follow up, we'll advise council that that has happened and uh, we'll go from there. That's really all. appreciate that. Anything sure. else before I adjourn this meeting? Oh, oh, sorry, step. Vice Mayor Pazillo. Well, just real quick. Um, I, I suspect we've got at a time when we've got uh, the, the new fees for the uh, fire reinspection, I believe, takes effect July 1. And I believe at some point in time, I'd like, and I don't know where what its schedule is for the council to possibly revisit that issue before it takes effect July 1. So, um, I think most of us up here are aware of that, but I just don't want that being forgotten because of all the stuff pushing through the budget. I just want to make sure that we cover that because there may be some of us <coughs> that may want to rethink that implementation on July 1, so. Okay. Councilwoman Osborne. Yes, I had a couple of um, directions following um, your lead there, Brian. Um, one of the items that, that we have consideration for, I'd like to be brought back as part of our dialogue for the 16th, um, and that is Loma Linda Park. Um, we have an, uh, the ability here to do something right, and um, we have a 35-year-old park <laughs> that is in need of major investment. It's in a historic neighborhood with very supportive and engaged citizens. Uh, we also have a partner with St. John Vianney, and uh, we have a rainy day fund that the citizens have put their money into. And I believe that some of that rainy day fund needs to be for the community. So um, I'd like to have part of that discussion in that inch thick or work session that we're gonna be having, some more information about the Loma Linda um, Park and that possibility. And also, um, I would like to have a yellow paper or some follow-up information regarding the amounts that the false alarms um, are taxing our police force with, and that as citizens we are paying for. And I'd like to have a little follow-up on that. Thank you. Is that all that? 
Uh, yes, uh, Mayor, members of the council, let me just hit those real quickly. One is on the fire inspection fees. That is something that can be talked about certainly after the 16th, uh, but prior to council uh, uh, going on vacation, I'll call it, uh, in between. Uh, and Loma Linda will have a, we'll go ahead and, ahead and show what we have in the budget for design as well as what the expended capital expenditures would be for that park, where the funding sources are as well. So we'll include that within our presentation. And then finally, uh, we will get an update on the false alarm Thank uh, you. impacts. One more thing, yes. I have a question. Um, are, are we going to have an opportunity to discuss the police and fire steps again? Uh, Mayor and uh, council member, uh, we will absolutely have that as part of the presentation. Now we have a recommendation, but that will be part of the work session. And part of the reason we're starting at four o'clock is to allow council to really vet all the issues is, is uh, so you can give that direction because uh, you know tentative budget adoptions just the following week. So that will be uh, absolutely part of the presentation. Okay, we will have an opportunity to give our take on it, what we would like to see. Yes, Council okay, thanks. Campbell. And you can see by tonight's action how long it takes us sometimes to vet this. So uh, we do need that time. Uh, and we all look forward to that, right? Absolutely. Uh, yes, Councilman Gelder. Could, could I follow up on um, Councilwoman Osborne's um, yellow paper on the alarm system? Do we, do we currently, I, how, how old is, I guess what I'm going to ask is, how old is our alarm ordinance and should we be revisiting that in the fall as with, you know, pro, a, a revised proposal of, so that we can better serve, one, our citizens, and two, better utilize our police assets? Uh, Mayor, Council Member Gelser. What we'll do, I don't know off the top of my head how long we've had that ordinance in place. What we will do is that'll be part of the history and we will certainly bring that back. I mean, this can be a work session type item where we can actually go into more detail, but at a minimum, we will include the history and uh, the uh, and where we've been to date with the false with the false alarm ordinance. Well, do, I, I, I just think the whole <laughs> alarm program needs to be visited. And I, I would just say, let's, let's, let's work can we work it towards a work session in the fall? It's not a crisis now. It's not, you know, it's not something that we need to do right away. But can we put it on the tickler list of this is something we need to update and think about and how we want to handle this? Uh, Mayor and Council Member Gelser, we'll, we'll get you a, again, a yellow paper before Council goes on recess. And if it's a work session item, that can certainly come up af after you uh, get back in August. So you'll get the information in advance and then we can put it in a work session later. Thank you. I'll ask one more time. <laughs> Have we done. all said what we wanted to say? I want to thank the people for staying this time and uh, all the staff that had to be here to this time. Uh, anyway, the meeting is now adjourned.